I know an awful lot of coalitions that have existed for 30 years. So I don't think that's as important. But if you look at the definition, that's definitely part of it. And, and it was a commonly held thing in nonprofits when I first started doing this work. Go on to the next one. Alliances. Um, there are a few organizations out there calling themselves alliances. Some are food system kind of organizations with very specific purposes. Um, but it's emerging of efforts or interests. They're usually more formalized. But it could be persons. It could be organizations. It refers to a variety of type of entities that can be allied. allied. We're in the, the term network for uh, in Detroit, there's a food systems network. There are some other ones around the state. Networks tend to not be as formal. Uh, they're organized for mutual assistance. They provide helpful information. They may be about communication. Um, it also could be that it's a network of like organizations. For example, farms or gardens that are networking together. So you could have a community garden network or a farming network, um, like the Women's Farming Network here in Oregon. Um, but you, you have to think that all of these names, people, as they're looking at the food system, they're seeing all these different names and trying to figure out some consistency between the organizations. So it's important to, um, to think about that. The last term that I want to talk about is food web. And this is one that's being used here in Oregon. I really, when I Googled, I couldn't find anywhere else that it's being used. I think it's very novel. And also, for some reason, people understand it. Um, it's actually a, a scientific term. Uh, comes from the soil food web. Um, but I think the important term in this is interrelated food chains. And I think somewhere in the future we'll see that there'll be a, a third part to this definition that talks about organizations related to community food systems. So food web is an interesting, an interesting term for, for these organizations to use. So the things I think you need to consider, and I think it's really important, is when you start forming an organization, you don't get in a big hurry. Not sure what that was. Don't get in a big hurry to decide what your mission, to, what your name is. Think about your mission and purpose. How formal do you intend to be? For example, probably with the examples I've given you, within the definition, council is the most formal of them. And network is probably the least formal. So where do you intend to be? Um, the other thing is that a lot of people want to put the name policy in their, in their group's name. And I've even seen very small communities tell me they wanted to be the food policy council, that their group wanted to be the food policy council. And, and I really um, encourage people to think seriously about that. I really don't believe that you should be calling yourself a policy council um, unless you're somehow exist in law. You know, are you, is your existence codified? Is it a, a state or a federal council? Is it a state or a local council of some sort? Is it recognized by your county? Um, I've seen policy councils uh, organize and sometimes they even get a 501c3, and then they would get resolutions from their local governments um, to recognize their existence. Um, but they re really weren't, uh, and, and that's one way to do it. But I've also seen policy groups like the Portland Multnomah Food Policy Council end up going out of existence because for one reason or another, the local official uh, didn't think that they were any longer needed. And I know that Iowa has struggled because they were created by um, a gubernatorial decree. And then when the governor, even during the time that Governor Vilsack was there, there were times that that, um, that document expired and they weren't legally in existence. So the, the formal policy piece that's uh, attached to government is a tricky thing. And it's something to really think about. And I also think in very small communities, if you decide to call yourself a policy council, you may actually drive participants away because they don't want to be involved in policy. 
Um, I think you also have to think about what your legal status is going to be. Are you going to be a 501c3? Are you going to be more informal? Um, what kind of organizing documents will you need? Do you need an MOU? Do you need bylaws? Do you need a charter? Um, there's any number of ways that you could formalize your agreements. Um, and the organizations that follow, the presenters that follow me are going to talk about that some, I think, in their presentations. But I think the biggest question is, when you put together a regional organization, how does this collective fit into or serve the current, the existing community food system? How do you work in with the organizations that are already there? And if you're going to do projects, which I really don't think anybody who calls themselves a policy council should be doing projects. They can do research, but they shouldn't be doing projects. Um, are you going to seek funding? Are you actually going to be competing for resources with the, with the organizations that are part of your collective organization? Um, and that's, or are you going to work, collaborate together for resources? But I don't think you should be working in any way that's, that's competitive or detracting from the other community food systems organizations, especially those within your network. So I think that's pretty much my comments, um, and I'll be here to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and so like I said, we're going to hold all questions to the end. So if you have any questions for Sharon, uh, just be sure to type those into the chat, and then we'll uh, have a question answer session at the end. So our next presenter is um, Kristen Frost-Albrecht from the North Coast Food Web. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to Kristen. Uh, so in addition to her part-time work as the North Coast Food Web Executive Director, uh, Kristen also serves as an instructor in family and community health and a small farms advocate with Clatsop County uh, OSU Extension Service, where she works closely with several community partners, including the local school districts and Clatsop Community Action Regional Food Bank. Uh, Kristen is an Oregon native who grew up in rural western Washington County where her first job uh, was at age eight as a berry picker in the local fields. Kristen has a considerable experience with community food systems work, including being a founder of the Cannon Beach Community Food Systems nonprofit in 2009, founder and operations manager of the Cannon Beach Food Pantry also in 2009, and founder and former manager of the Cannon Beach Farmers Market uh, begun in 2008. Uh, Kristen's board service includes serving as vice president of the Oregon Farmers Market Association, as a board member of Friends of the Class of Community Garden Association and as a board advisor uh, to several farmers markets. So with that, uh, we'll let Kristen uh, start. So, Kristen, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, so as Spencer mentioned, I'm the executive director of North Coast Food Web. Um, and North Coast Food Web exists to rebuild the food system on the North Oregon coast. And I'll show you what the North Oregon coast looks like uh, with the next slide. So uh, we're, again, in the northwest section of the United States. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a map of our area. Um, this is also known as the Lower Columbia Pacific Region. We're surrounded on two sides by water, on the Oregon side anyway, um, the Pacific Ocean on the west, and then the mighty Columbia, which uh, goes up from Astoria up and is our border between Oregon and Washington. So our service area actually extends over into the Long Beach Peninsula and then uh, the Waukiacum and Pacific County areas of Washington. Next slide, please. So um, in 2009, we had a feast. The first one um, was Food Education Agricultural Solutions Together. And this was in Cannon Beach, and just following the beginning of the Cannon Beach Farmers Market. Um, this was a coming together of people interested in remaking the food system. We had about 65 people from all walks of life. We had farmers, we had fishermen, we had government um, people, we had mayors. And we started to talk about what a food system was. 
and why that mattered to any of us. That same day in Cannon Beach was also the first day of um, a rare AmeriCorps named John Dean. And John uh, had, had come to Clatsop County to help do the uh, report on the food system for Clatsop County, a Clatsop Community Food System Assessment. And that proved to be an amazing document. He spent a year doing that with this small collection of um, interested residents. And uh, he helped us map what our future was going to look like. Next slide, please. So um, we were fortunate enough to receive a Meyer Memorial Trust Community Food System Implementation Grant in partnership with a sister community food system organization, Food Roots. This was really early on in our formation as a group and gave us a tremendous leg up because it allowed us to fund a quarter time uh, executive director and then a projects coordinator for, for food system projects. And that was in 2011. We're actually uh, just starting our third year of this grant. At the same time, as uh, Spencer mentioned, I also took on a job with Oregon State University Extension and was able to, with their blessing, incubate the North Coast Food Web from within their offices. And that worked out really great um, because so much of the same work we were interested in doing um, traditionally has been done by extension. And all the way along, we also had the fabulous mentoring by Sharon Thornberry at Oregon Food Bank. So this photo is a picture of our very hardworking, um, grassroots-driven uh, founding board of North Coast Food Web. Next slide, please. So why start a community food system? Well, we have a fairly serious regional food insecurity. We had a storm called the Gale of 2007 that really wiped out the North Coast, left most of us without power for a week to two weeks. And it made, I think, a number of us realize how totally susceptible we were to um, being hungry because we simply are so isolated uh, on all sides by some of these events. Uh, we also have one in four SNAP eligible in our region. Over 60%, it's actually maybe a little closer to 70% of our school-aged youth are on free and reduced lunch. We have high rates of unemployment because we're a seasonal economy, a tourist economy, which means I live in the little town of Cannon Beach, which is 1,700 year-round. And in the summertime, our um, residents swell to about 15,000. And so um, that's a huge, <laughs> huge, hugely taxing on our region. And that happens all over the North Coast. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. The other reason that we started, there's been a real regional decline in farms. Oregon uh, has about 38,000 farms. And I think in the US is really bucking the trend. But in Clatsop County, we're actually 35th out of 36 in terms of regional um, agricultural production. And we've got aging farmers up in the high ends of the 50s, uh, high land costs because, of, again, we're a tourist uh, area. And so second home prices have driven up the cost of farmland. OK, next slide. Um, we have some other challenges. I always put this slide in here just because we live in a very dynamic um, climate. And uh, Dismal Niche, Cape Disappointment St. Park, these were areas that were named by Lewis and Clark back in 1842. Um, we have a high threat of tsunami. Uh, coastal hazards are something that we're all very aware of. And they, they add to our food security concerns because we are at risk of some um, huge huge uh, events that could leave us without access to food for a very long period of time. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so we got going in, in 2011, we were forming in 2010, and we've been doing our projects really since uh, 2011. We started an all food farmers market um, that's been tremendously successful. We started it in order to uh, make it easy for small farms to, um, all of a sudden my uh, screen is, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, to outlet to sell their, their uh, produce and meats and seafood. Uh, we've done a beginning farmer education program. Uh, our farmers markets done three seasons worth of snap match, uh, totaling $15,000. Uh, this particular photo is a young man doing, um, <laughs> waving around a very robust stock of Brussels sprouts. We do food literacy out in the schools, and this is during our Food Day Week, uh, an event we do in tandem with International Food Day. And we set up a produce petting zoo so kids familiarize themselves with fresh produce, what it looks like, what it is, what is its name. So this year was a Particular, particular hallmark because the kindergartners actually knew what Brussels sprouts were. I was pretty thrilled. Okay, next. So why formalize? Now I can remember sitting with uh, my my founding board saying the last thing we need is another 501c3. I really wasn't convinced that uh, we needed to do this. I just finished doing one uh, in Cannon Beach. But as we talked through it, and we did really consider this, the things that we wanted to do, we knew that we needed nonprofit status um, so that we could go after grants and go after funding and partner up with uh, other agencies that might also not have nonprofit status. And so we decided to go ahead and do this. Um, and I do have to just say, too, since I work with Extension, one of the things that we realized and has been such a valuable partnership for us is so much of the things we were talking about doing used to be done by extension. And because of funding and a host of reasons, those things haven't been done, at least in my community, for a while. So we were really filling a need, a historic need that was there. Um, I think also what's happening, and we could sort of see this coming, I think it's, it's really coming to fruition now, is that we are building a safety net for the decline in government funding for services for our most vulnerable residents and uh, the elderly and our children. And I think we're really starting to see that happen. Okay, next slide. So why regional? Well, we started in one community um, in Cannon Beach. And we had recognized that that was great for one community, but really this was a consistent issue across our region. And that we all have very similar um, needs because of our, isolate, our um, isolated uh, geography. And that if we all work together out of our individual um, cities and communities, we would be stronger. And I, I think that's really proven to be the case. Um, this photo, just by the way, I believe it's really important to uh, partner up with government. This is our, the mayor of Cannon Beach, who is celebrating our uh, getting SNAP uh, EBT at the Cannon Beach Farmers Market. That's our first day. So, okay, next slide. Well, our initial goals and expectations. Just hearkening back to that day of feast, and we, we drew up a whole list of things. Um, but at the top of that list, it's always been food security for all, good, clean, fair food. I like the way Slow Food says it. Uh, and in our map, our, our community uh, guide that, again, the Rare AmeriCorps helped uh, put together, we really wanted to have all food farmers markets that provided access to quality local food for everybody. And that's definitely come to fruition. Um, again, building those direct market opportunities for new beginning and existing farmers. But I think something we didn't initially have on our radar quite so much, which might be a surprise since we're surrounded by water, is also the, for the fishing community. It's really actually hard to get fresh fish on the coast. 
it all gets exported or it goes into the metro areas. So that's been definitely another target too. And then um, we had a real emphasis on SNAP eligible audiences, uh, which, is, which is everybody on the coast. Um, it's our friends, our family, our neighbors. And again, beginning farmer education, that was something that we were really committed to because we have uh, su such low agricultural production. Okay, next slide. So what's changed? Um, I think as we've gone down the road here this three and four years, uh, there's, we have a lot more emphasis on building skills of South Carolina for everybody. And we are talking a lot more about community resilience across the region, all ages, all audiences, in the schools, building those skills that used to, to be. Um, we've noticed that our kids are hungry to learn how to cook. And so are our adults, and actually all ages. Um, we've also, I think we're understanding our limits as an organization of what we can and can't do. <laughs> That's been a really hard lesson. And then I think we, we began this conversation, and it had a ripple effect. And now we're noticing a lot of other groups picking up and starting to do many of the same things that we had started. And so I like the term collective impact because that's making real change happen. Okay, next slide. Organizational challenges. Well, <clears throat> money, money is always a challenge. We've been very fortunate because we received the Meyer grant. That's really helped us out a lot. And we, went very quickly into projects. There was a real urgency in the people that have served on our board and our volunteers about food security. So I think we've been very project driven and very outcome driven. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking hard now at money as we're in the third year of this grant and developing a, a fundraising program. Um, and because of this urgency, We've probably had some burnout. I know we've had some burnout. Um, we're startup. We've been startup. Uh, partnerships and collaboration. We do everything in partnership and collaboration. I, I think it's a hallmark of who we are. Um, I can't imagine doing the work we've done without really great relationships. However, with those great relationships, as Sharon mentioned, uh, Knowing your contractual obligations, be it MOU um, or, or what, um, that is a whole nother arena all into itself um, that's important, important to consider, important to nurture those relationships. And then um, organizational development and prioritization of goals. We're really deciding where we're headed and how we want to look and what we can do. Okay, next slide. So why partnerships and collaborations? We really are stronger working together and bringing to the table our individual strengths and talents. Um, again, all of our projects are, we do in tandem with others. And uh, in a small community like ours, I think that is the only way to work. Okay, next. Okay, our future goals, um, as I mentioned, we're really focused on fund development right now. Um, we've shifted from a project coordinator to an outreach and development coordinator uh, to encourage this. Um, we're also encouraging other groups that we've worked with to take ownership of specific projects. And that's, that's actually going really quite well. And then uh, one thing we've, we've done, I, I like to think we have a real culture of sharing uh, again, the urgency of this work dictates that maybe a bit, but we've uh, tried to share and um, what successes we've had and, and help other people with roadmaps to, to doing those projects so they don't have to come up with them for themselves. Okay, next slide. Okay, plans for expansion. Um, we're definitely looking at the need for more staff. 
uh, especially full-time employed staff, and stable funding. Uh, I like working within the institutional structures that already exist. Again, with extension in Oregon, we have a four-county region. And that makes a lot of sense to me, that if these community food system groups can work within um, something like extension, I think it gives us, again, a lot of strength, a lot of breadth in the audiences that we can reach. And then I personally would love to see a, a state food council. To go to meeting. There are 66 other callers on the call. All right, sorry about that, Kristen. I don't know if you're uh, still talking. We got cut off there. Um, Kristen, are you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, sorry about that. I think we lost you about uh, 30 seconds ago. Okay. Um, well, I think this is my last slide. Had I spoken to it already then? Some of it. You've just gotten the State Food Council. Okay. Uh, and th so I'll just leave it at that then. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that, Kristen. Thank you. Um, oh, I guess it was just us that couldn't hear it. Um, but yeah, thank you, Kristen, for sharing. And now we're going to go to our next uh, speaker, um, which is Sarah Miller from the Northeast Oregon Economic Development District. And uh, Sarah Miller is a facilitator and development specialist with the NEOEBB um, and is committed to helping rural communities create their own destiny. She enjoys working with small businesses, community leaders, and volunteers to develop and complete important projects in their hometowns. Examples of recent projects include bicycle and agritourism development, the www.wallawafund.org website, regional food system development, and match savings for entrepreneurs. Uh, Sarah lives on a small family ranch in Wallawa County where she and her husband produce grass-finished artisan bunch grass beef and provide ecological consulting services. So with that, we'll let Sarah take the stage. Sarah, are you there? Um, sorry, I guess we're just having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so uh, we'll just hold on for a minute here. Um, and see if she can try to reconnect. Sorry, everyone. We're going to just give it one more second to see if she can connect. Um, yeah, Sarah, if you could try to activate your mic, that would be great.
Sarah, are you there? All right, well, we might have to um, move on to our next presenter and see if we can figure out how to um, fix Sarah. So um, let's see if Wendy and Ron are with us. Uh, Ron, are you there? This is Wendy. I'm here. Oh, okay, Wendy's here. Me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. 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 So uh, so we'll. So I'm, you know, I, oh. I. It looks like Ron is on, and I, Ron and I are doing back and forth, and I'm going first anyway. So, would you like me to just take it away? Sure. Yeah. We'll just. And it looks like Ron is on, so. I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just quickly introduce you guys. Uh, so, Wendy is the principal of Boulder-based uh, WPM Consulting, which works with diverse partners to build healthier living environments. And she staffs the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council and earlier helped develop the Colorado Food Policy Blueprint with Live Well Colorado. Ms. Uh, Wendy holds a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Washington and a master's degree in sitting planning from the University of California, Berkeley. And then um, our other presenter is Ron Carlton, who uh, has worked for over 30 years in the U.S. Congress and comes to the Colorado Department of Agriculture with considerable experience in ag policy. As a legislative assistant and legislative director, he covered not only agricultural issues, but also energy, environment, water, and land management issues. Most recently, as chief of staff to then Colorado Congressman John Salazar, Carlton helped develop and guide agricultural policy, assisting the congressman and staff with his work on the House Agricultural Committee and the 2008 Farm Bill. Um, a resident of Fort Collins, Carlton holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Houston and a master's degree from the American University, and a law degree from George Mason University School of Law. And in addition to his work in Congress, uh, Ron was also an adjunct professor with the School of Business at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, and teaches classes on public policy and administrative law. So thank you both for uh, joining us. And so with that, Wendy, uh, take it away. Thanks, Spencer. This is Wendy. Hi, everybody. Um, and I think as your introduction demonstrates, we are really, really lucky to have Ron here in the state of Colorado with us. So, and Ron is actually joining us from Washington, D.C. Um, he is so on demand, but he made some time. He broke free for the USDA to join this webinar. So Ron is staff for the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council, and Ron is our chair of the council. We're going to kind of tag team this um, PowerPoint. So I hope it works OK. So go ahead to the next slide, please, Spencer. Great. So Spencer asked us to talk a little bit about just sort of how the council came to be and then its current organizational structure as a state council and then talk a little bit about some pros and cons of this process and of the organizational structure for those of you who may be considering establishing or reestablishing a state council. Um, as you know, there are many ways to do this and there are pros and cons to all ways. So here in Colorado, um, the effort to create a state council was really led and still um, really managed by an organization called Live Well Colorado. And you can see their website there. Live Well Colorado is a statewide nonprofit. And their mission is really, their focus is really to sort of curb the growing tide of overweight and obesity rates and to focus um, on promoting healthy eating and active living through policy and environmental change to do so. So as Spencer mentioned, Live Well and I worked together back in 2009. <laughs> Um, doing developing this food policy blueprint, which is a statewide scan that looked at how can we, for the state of Colorado, really promote access to healthy food through policy change at a state level. And one of the recommendations that ended up coming out of that food policy blueprint was this, that we needed a statewide vo a voice at the state level that really represented food system interests to speak to the state of Colorado um, on behalf of food systems and food policy issues. Um, also at the same time, the Centers for Disease Control had just issued one of their uh, fruit and vegetable indicator reports. Um, and as you know, our, our largest public health entity, the CDC had recommended, if, you know, if you're really looking at increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, 
explore this idea through policy councils and look at how you can establish one at, at a state level. So sort of these recommendations coming out um, all around the same time led Live Well Colorado to initiate this through the legislative process. So as it says here, the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council uh, was created first through a bill in 2010. And it was given a three-year sort of sunset review deadline. So, um, and that's the last bullet here. So it actually was just renewed last year. And it, it was a three-year, and actually the council had only been meeting actively for two years by the time that that sunset review was triggered. And I'm very glad to say that it was renewed, and we were given actually five years this time before review again. But I actually think it was a very, very good thing to kind of have to go through this process again and have to go through it pretty quickly. The first time around, the bill didn't, um, you know, the bill didn't have a whole lot of out, real opposition, um, and, and, and it, but it also didn't have a whole lot of, of supporters, big partners, um, and it went through kind of easily. And what, but what happened, what was triggered through the Sunset Review, is that Live Well Colorado council members did a lot of intentional outreach with all sorts of food, nutrition, agriculture organizations around the state to kind of say, now you've seen two years of us. This is why we're here. This is why we want to support this renewal bill going forward. So I actually think it was a really good process to do a lot of that partnership building that was triggered by this, the legislative process. So next slide. Is a, so this is our current organizational structure. Um, and I must say back to, to harking back to Sharon's PowerPoint around what's in a name. Um, so just a little bit about the Colorado Food Systems Advisory Council. In 2010, there's actually a lot of focus put on that name when the bill was being drafted. Um, it was very, very important to several organizations that the word policy not be in the name. And we can talk more about this throughout this, but it is the Colorado Food System. So we want an, an entity, a council, um, a, a body of people that do represent Colorado's food system, but it is going to be very advisory in nature. This is, you know, not a body that's there to write or draft or comment on the on bill legislation on that kind of policy. It's very educational and advisory in nature. So there's a lot to a name, as Sharon was saying. Um, so what we are, it is legislatively mandated, created through the legislative process. It is a governor seated council. They're all volunteer, um, although there are several state agencies and organizations represented on the council where this this is now obviously part of they're written into their their work plan and their scope of work. Um, and then we have several, you know, residents of the state of Colorado. This is truly volunteer effort. There are now fifteen people on the council. The council does meet quarterly. It used to meet more often. It is only mandated to meet quarterly and that's what we're sticking to right now. Um, and as I was sort of alluding to, this is not a policy making entity or body. Um, it really is in existence to be a voice to the state of Colorado around food systems issues. So it does not make policy. There are a lot of entities that do that. Um, rather, it, its simple mandate is to issue two reports a year to the General Assembly uh, and the Governor's Office. So specifically to our House and Senate Health and Agriculture Committees and the Governor's Office and the Commissioner of Agriculture, who is Ron's boss. Um, but the, the, the mandate is actually very simple. It's say October and January issue a report of what you've been up to and your recommendations each year of what are some things that we could be educated on or move on at the state level. Um, we have a pretty, pretty basic structure. We have one chair, Ron, who's on the phone. And then we have one vice chair. And we have it written in that only one of those could be from a state agency at a time. We do have a lot of detail written up. Um, around a consensus building decision-making framework. So we have, we don't call them bylaws, we have policies and procedures with extensive language around what that means to really build consensus. We did write into that pro this process and procedures, um, basically, how do you actually get to a vote if you ever needed to? How do you actually get to sort of a majority voting structure if consensus building isn't working? The council has never had to do that, and I, I don't see a scenario in the near future where it has to be. The focus is really just on developing consensus as a process. And then finally, there's very part-time staff funded. It continues to be funded through Live Well Colorado, and that is as me. And I've been the staff since the beginning. So I'm going go to go to the next slide, and then I'll talk about some pros and cons of this. So just so you see, the council members, it's fairly similar to what you see from most state councils um, or from even local food policy councils, um, is that we have that spectrum of 
you know, of the food system represented. Um, so we have, as you can see, retailers, producers, nutritionists, anti-hunger. Um, we also have as a rural community economic development seat is we have the state director for USDA Rural Development. Um, we were able to add two seats, which was another bonus of having to go through this sunset review so, so early in the life of the council. We were able to go back and say, actually, we need to grow this a little bit. So we added basically an academic seat as a member of the School of Public Faculty from the School of Public Health, and we added the director of Colorado State University Extension, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about as a critical partner. Uh, we needed them formally at the table. And then actually, as you can see at the top, um, which is sort of I think one of the strongest assets of this council is because it is a governor-appointed, legislatively mandated council, you have this mandated representation from several of our state departments, so agriculture, education, human services, and public health and environment. And then we also have this bonus of having the state director of, of USDA Rural Development. Um, and so if, so thank you, Spencer asked us to think a little bit about some of the pros and cons of this, this structure. And I think that this is sort of the unique um, the uniqueness, I think, of having, when you have a legislatively created body and you mandate your participation of your state agencies, some of the assets that that brings in is that then you have the regulatory agencies to which, you know, which you want to influence, where you would like to partner with and to make change, you have them there at the table from the very beginning and all the time. And so what we have seen from our experience is that the council has been very effective at bringing these agencies together who haven't for before this really honestly had a chance or even an excuse to come together and talk and be together. But you have them at the table and able to listen and learn and grow together and go back to their departments and make institutional changes without even having to go through any sort of legislative process. Um, and we will mention that a bit more about that in some of our accomplishments. So you have some of those, you know, the agencies at the table that can just go and make change happen from the beginning, which is great. Some of the limitations that come with this, however, is that these are also entities that, that that can't lobby, we can't be making policy. And it was clear in the mandate, and then we have folks at the table that definitely have to excuse themselves from any sort of policy making or lobbying anyway. So there are constant conversations in our meetings about that sort of delicate balance of, ooh, well, we we have this, this mandate to advise our state government bodies, our governor's office and legislators, but then there's this constant com you know, conversation of, well, can I meet with a legislator? Can I not? Do I have to go through the bureaucracy of talking to my legislative liaison? Who needs to do this? Who can? So there's always this very delicate balance of how you deal with influencing state government when you're trying to avoid sort of formal policy making and drafting. You have some members of your council that can't actively play a role in that. Um, but again, I think that real asset is that you do have folks that immediately can begin making institutional change happen. So um, you can go ahead to go, and Ron's going to take it over at the next slide, and then I'll pick it back up later. Ron, are you there? So I cannot hear Ron, and so Spencer, if you need me to keep going, just let me know. Yeah, um, it looks like I've uh, uh, unmuted Ron, so maybe if it's on on his end with uh, his mic, looks like he's unmuted himself, but why don't you just, um, Wendy, if you don't mind, just keep going, and then if we can, uh, if we hear from Ron, then he can take over from there. Oh, that's great. Ron, if you're out there, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so just to give you, I'm just going to rock through a little bit more about sort of the council's up to now. So this is the council's charge. The council actually wrote this themselves. We changed it out of the legislation. Um, and it's to advance recommendations that strengthen healthy food access for all Coloradans through Colorado agriculture and local food systems and economies. And as you'll see when we go to accomplishments, those sort of like the two, two main issues that the council is always focusing on. It does this grow our local agriculture economy 
And, but is this, a, is this effective strategy at really promoting healthy food access for those who don't necessarily have healthy food access in the state of Colorado? So next slide. So accomplishments. Um, Ron, chime in any time here. But accomplishments since the very beginning, I think there have been a lot of accomplishments um, related to communications and engagement. So the council made a very intentional decision right out of the chute to not do a statewide food systems assessment. I still think there's a huge need for that, but I think this was a good call that the council actually made a choice to go out and see and hear and listen and learn. So we all got on a bus for a couple of days, and you can't tour a whole state even a couple of days, but we, we met with several local food policy councils and local organizations and several farms. Um, and 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 just listen to her and talk about what's going on with our food system. And Ron, if you join us, jump in any time. Um, and then the council also held or participated in several listening sessions uh, in several places throughout the state. Uh, some some fun little things they did is we did an all call to design the logo. We we sent the all call out to um, graphic design you know folks in universities and colleges and community colleges across the state and had a big competition just to kind of increase the awareness and involve people. One thing we'll talk about more is we did extensive um, surveying and then interviews of local food policy councils or food systems coalitions, whatever they call themselves, a year and a half ago. We've created a form on the website, um, an issue submission form that Again, it's not sort of the end-all, be-all, but a way where anyone could come on and say, here's an issue that we're seeing in our food system state of Colorado. We'd like to put it forward to you for your consideration. So we have a process for doing that. And of course, all the meetings, public meetings, are, they're all open to the public. At our last meeting two weeks ago, I think we had four or five guests of local food policy councils, which was really great. Um, so other accomplishments. The perfect example, I think, of what can come out of a state council is that it's just sort of the spin-off effects. So early on, we had two members, the director of the Colorado Farmers Market Association and our state director of Share Our Strength, which is an anti-hunger um, group and the group that, um, and she also ran the Cooking Matters group uh, in Colorado. And they came together and met through the, you know, through the state council and kind of just went off and did this offshoot work around looking at this issue of use of SNAP at farmers markets. It's something that had been heard um, from communities all around the state that there's an interest in or concern around or some barriers around, but definitely interest to, just interest to see how it could grow. And they went off and kind of gr formed their own working group and were very successful at securing grant funds and then bringing in both federal and state regulatory agencies to really address this issue. So again, a perfect example, I think, of how our state council can move to make institutional change without necessarily having to go through any sort of legislative process is that they brought in our State Department of Human Services and and that through that work with CDHS um, has since allocated significant staff time internally to this issue, resources, staff time, technical assistance to working with farmers markets throughout the state to have EBT technology as well as SNAP education and SNAP outreach at farmers markets. So again, a lovely example of, of why having some of the state agencies at the table is great. And then issue briefs. So. Um, the council now, the focus of the council now is to, to issue what they uh, to issue what they call issue briefs, um, two sort of deep dive documents on issues that they've heard are being very relevant to the state of Colorado. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just show you a quick um, snippet, uh, some snapshots of some of these issue briefs. So these are just some snapshots of one of the issue briefs that was done on this issue of um, SNAP, increasing SNAP at farmers markets. The other issue brief that the council just, we just released these in November of 2013, was on the need to really enhance and grow direct market technical assistance in the state of Colorado. And that sort of harkens back to what Kristen was saying about extension. And we have fabulous extension agents throughout the state of Colorado. But sort of what Kristen was alluding to as well as extension in many states is always a um, sort of threat of losing some funding. And um, some funding has been has lost over the years. Um, and so what we had found is that the, the services that Extension provides across the food system spectrum, um, but particularly in growing new farmers, accessing direct markets within the state, is so important that you know, we really need to focus that and expand it and make sure that these services are provided in the same way throughout the state. Um, so this is just an example of this. So what the council did is develop two of these. They're about four pages each. And the point is to really just enhance the issue, call attention to it, have these lovely infographics, 
um, that, kind of, that speak to a lot of people to say why is this an issue across the state of Colorado, and then more importantly, these end with what can the state of Colorado do about this. So this is a perfect example of I think where state councils can be effective. And so listen and learn, assign issues that you see across communities, the state, and then be that voice to the state and say, listen, we're seeing this all around the state, but there is a role for the state of Colorado, either a policy or a regulatory or technical assistance or financial level, there is a role for the state to play here and make this easier for all communities. And so that's how these issues should be sort of land on a series of recommendations to the state of Colorado. And right now the state council is sort of in the midst of then moving these forward. So Ron, for example, will be testifying to the Ag Committees in this month in February. Our state legislature is in session. And there'll be other meetings, strategic meetings with other legislators in the governor's office to sort of bring attention to these issues. So next slide. Um, and then challenges, I said there's pros and cons of all, uh, all types of councils. Um, as I've heard, I think, from a lot of other food policy councils, state and local, is it is a slow process. Like, what the council's trying to do is, is, is institutional change. Um, sometimes that takes a really long time to kind of move the dial. This council is not a task force. It's not a roll up your sleeve, do it, build it, project, pilot task force. It is an advisory body. And so sometimes it takes a really long time to listen and learn and identify state partners that can make a change and then work with them to make those changes. Other challenges have been that if you, you um, and this is not necessarily a challenge, but sometimes it is not, but just a diverse knowledge base, that all members come to this with very, starting from very different perspectives. Some came to this never even heard of, heard of the term food policy council or some sort of related council. Um, and so just how do you step one, work with your you know, 15 members to kind of get to, we all kind of have a similar understanding of the food system, let alone represent the state. It is hard to secure statewide representation. I think every state um, feels this. Um, we do our best. We do have members from outside of, of Denver, but our meetings are always in Denver. Um, lack of funding. This was very clear from the legislative process that there would be no fiscal note, so the state does not financially support this, even though it is mandated to report and advise the state. Um, as I mentioned before, sort of that lack of teeth is that it's not, they're not a policy-making body. They can advise and educate and elevate issues, but beyond that, you, can, you know, you never know what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. Um, and like I said, it's not sort of a, a roll up your sleeves, do it task force. We don't often have those. Here's the project we built, so it's been hard sometimes to convey the success of the council because people keep saying, well, what do you do? What do you do? What did you build? What did you do? And it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Than that. So um, next slide, how we're getting around some of, some of these challenges, um, I think is where it's very, very exciting. I wish we could tell you more. I could tell you more a lot after next week. But how I think we're, the council really hopes to address some of these issues of lack of funding, lack of reach across the state, is really working deeply with local food policy councils, or whatever they call themselves. The local food coalition, they all have different names, but that, that with local councils. So as I mentioned, the council did extensive surveying and interviewing of local council a year and a half ago. Um, since last February has been hosting, with Live Well Colorado, monthly calls, networking calls to local councils. Um, to support peer-to-peer -peer sharing across local councils. And then next week, next Tuesday and Wednesday, um, we're actually the state council with Live Well Colorado um, and every local council we could identify in the state of Colorado is coming together for two days to, to meet, to convene, to share, to talk about how can we all come together and learn from each other and establish some peer networking but also how can we maybe come together to be a collective voice around food systems and healthy food access policy in the state of Colorado. So a lot of what we're going to be doing next week is um, talking about how coalition building and how do we do that together, but also are there some things that collectively we all could work on together that could move the dial on to promote healthy food access in Colorado. Um, and then we'll, we'll be taking steps to really formalize that network, although Sharon just said networks aren't formal, so we've got to come up with a different name, but to really formalize a coalition of coalitions so that the state council has this body that they can always really work with and tap into and elevate those issues. The state council does not have a lot of funding. They can't go out traveling the state all the time to listen and learn. So how do we create these relationships and partnerships so we can hear 
from around the state, what are the issues of our food system that the state council could then be that voice to state government on. So we're really excited about this next step. Um, I think it's more and more a lot of the direction most states are taking is to foster some of this real coalition building and have these mutual relationships between local councils and the state council. Um, and I'm very excited to see where it goes. So I think the next slide is simply our contact information. And Ron, if you're listening, I hope I did an okay job. Here are our websites, here are our contact information, um, and thank you for your patience with uh, some of our technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Um, that was great. I really appreciate you uh, stepping in there. And Ron, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what was going on with the, um, the mic there for you. But um, Sarah, are you there now? Looks like um, you're self-muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. So Yay. let me get to your slides. And sorry about that. Um, thanks for everyone's patience. So uh, without further ado, Sarah, you can talk about the Walla County Food System Council. Thank you very much. So our council is very informal at this point in time, and I'm just going to share a little bit of information about how we got to where we are and where we're going from here. The Economic Development District uh, is occupies Baker Union and, and Wallowa counties, but we're engaged with only one uh, council type group, and that is in Wallowa County. We are part of a five county project collaborative project, the Northeast Oregon Community Food System Collaborative, which is one of the community food projects funded through the Meyer Memorial Trust initiative. So um, the next slide, please. So in Malawi County, community food organizing kind of started back in 2006, where there were some um, just local leadership that organized a few meetings and some events were held. We had an awesome harvest dinner with local foods, with over 200 people who participated. And this is, a, this is a county, it's a very rural, isolated county in the far northeast corner of Oregon with a total population of 7,000 people. And we also have 40% self-employment. So the small business piece, is, as you will see, is really important in our work. Um, the next really significant thing that happened on the local food scene was the organization of a local chapter of Slow Food USA. Um, following that, fairly quickly, that uh, Slow Food partner and some other folks organized a feast workshop from the Oregon Food Bank. And through that process, uh, we realized that we needed more information if we were going to try to work together on addressing food system needs in our county. So Oregon Food Bank funded a rare volunteer, and we were able to have that person work for us for a year, Joshua Russell, and he completed our community food assessment. Um, so we kind of segued from the feast organizing committee into the members of the Food System Council. And how that happened was that when Joshua Russell came on board as our rare, he really emphasized that the food assessment is a process. It's not just a document or a set of data. It's really a process where we are developing our relationships, how we're going to work together when we know what the state of our um, community food system is. And as we went through um, discussing that and how to move forward, we realized we need a level of commitment um, to make that worthwhile. And that point, that's the point at which the kind of feast organizing committee became the first food system council. The council has members representing the Slow Food Chapter, the Community Connection Food Bank and Senior Meals Organization, the Economic Development District. Uh, we have producers, both crop and livestock producers. We have representatives of the farmers markets, community garden and faith-based projects, farm to school, and then individuals who also uh, represent other groups such as the Grange, the 4-H, etc. And one of our key partners that's not primarily located here is Oregon Rural Action, which is a uh, broader Eastern Oregon organizing nonprofit. So the reasons we came together, very similar to the ones you've already heard, economic reasons, health reasons, community reasons, 
And the vision of the council is community members in Wallowa County engaged in growing an equitable local food system that promotes economic development, community development, and sustainable agriculture. Next slide, please. So once the community food assessment was complete, we had a list of 21 opportunities that we could that needed attention and were probably worthwhile to pursue. Obviously, that was way more than any of the council members or our you know organizations or volunteers uh, friends could take on. So Sharon Thornberry came out and helped us facilitate our first strategic plan in the fall of 2012, and we had great participation with that. Um, this next year, this last fall, in October, we had our second planning workshop where we updated our strategic plan for this coming year. And Matt Buck helped us a lot with a uh, presentation for that. Next slide. The priorities from the strategic plan um, really haven't changed from the 2012 plan to the 2013 plan. Our goals are uh, helping producers, strengthening their networks, and improving their operations to give us that that robust uh, local partner on the growing side and also on the processing and access side. Um, the second one was the, the community garden slash farm to school connection. And the third one was um, helping support our farmers market. Next slide. So when we went into our strategic planning process in 2013, we did a quick look back at what were some of the milestones from our first year of working together. And here's just kind of a list. Um, a really landmark thing that happened this past year was the huge shift in um, Farm Services Agency from USDA in, in being willing to consider what were previously designated ineligible hobby farms and allowing, providing actually proactively support through their microloan program. So we helped get the word out, and we've, we've had a couple farmers actually access those funds for their businesses. And then you can see there's a number of other benefits from the investment in the production and processing side. Next slide. In our second goal, working with these community gardens and schools, um, we have two community gardens active in the county. One is a pretty robust uh, partnership, and it's going into its fourth year, which is a partnership between the Joseph United Methodist Church Magic Garden Project and the Joseph Charter School. Um, though that's been a really positive partnership that initially grew out of just wanting to provide food access and education in the school, but in fact the garden has been so successful that it's been able to provide food to a, a, a range of food access providers in Willowa County. Next slide. The third goal for collaboration among the farmers markets was really, it's, it's really awesome to watch uh, those partners build trust. And that's probably one of the most important things because we had an established farmers market which operated two markets, two weekly markets in the summer. And there's a lower valley, Willowa County kind of has an upper valley with the the larger towns of Enterprise and Joseph, and the lower valley with the smaller town of Wallowa. And folks in Wallowa really wanted to uh, improve the food access and the opportunities for producers to sell food, so they started their own market. And they really benefited a lot from partnering with the Wallowa Valley Farmers Market Organization. They didn't become part of that organization. They really wanted to be their own standalone market. But they've now collaborated on raising, applying for funds through Slow Food Wallowas and receiving their first $2,700 to fund match incentives and get a lemonade stand. So it's really great to see them working together. Next slide. Um, as part of the five county Northeast Oregon uh, Regional Food System Collaborative, we are part of an ongoing assessment process. And part of that assessment process is interviewing the Food Council. And, and so I was able to ask our members about our success factors. And of course, you know, they look at the entrepreneurial and self-reliant spirit of rural communities, and they feel like that's, that's just a key factor. 
but also the growing awareness of the need to change for people making food system work a priority. Um, and I think that uh, our, we, everybody recognized without the rare volunteer and some of the technical assistance that we've received from the Oregon Food Bank, we also would have had, had struggled to get through some of that strategic planning and research. So those have been, um, these have all been important factors for the project. Next slide. Some of the um, challenges that we're facing, our meeting participation has fluctuated. There are times of year when we have a lot better participation and times when we don't. Um, we're very much opportunity driven. We rely on Oregon Rural Action to be kind of our policy partner. We're not a policy council, but we want to know when there are policies that are being worked on by others so we can inform our networks and give people the opportunity to get engaged in that if they would like. Um, we just kind of reevaluated the membership of the council, which again, it's very informal, and people are really interested in continuing on. Next slide. So part of this regrouping and saying, you know, after a year organizationally, we, we know we're having these project successes and people are getting value out of the council. So we kind of said, organizationally, who's really still committed and why? And the kinds of reasons people gave for really staying committed included that the council they see has a central networking and coordinating role and an accountability role for work that we're sharing together and for work that individual organizations are engaged in but need that kind of um, sounding board and encouragement or uh, suggestion. We also see that the gardens and the farmers markets are projects that we're definitely going to continue to sustain investment in however we can, and so we're strategizing on that now. Uh, we kind of have been stuck in our food production processing. Some of the, the networking that we wanted to foster hasn't happened. And we have the opportunity to apply for another rare volunteer to help us with a few key goal areas that could use additional support and move forward into the next few years. So that's about it for me. And uh, I'll wait for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I just, again, want to thank all of our presenters uh, for uh, presenting their various topics. There's a lot of great information. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, and I also wanted to thank all the attendees and uh, for their patience with our technical difficulties. But um, now I'm going to open it up for questions. And we've already gotten a couple uh, through. Oh, and one other thing that I just want to ask before we uh, close, if um, just so that we can track how many folks were uh, participating in this webinar. If there's any uh, folks that were uh, part of a group of people listening in, if you could just let me know how many extra people were listening, that we would greatly appreciate that. So um, thank you. And so now uh, we'll open up to questions. The first question uh, is, how do we form food coalitions or councils that reflect the ethnic, racial, class, and gender demographics of our communities when people of color may not have traditional leaders' positions in the existing food system. And I'll open that up to anyone. So this is Sharon. Um, I think you have to do some community building and, and partnership building um, in order to make that happen. And it's not easy. We've, um, for several years, worked to develop relationships with the Latino population. And it's taken some significant um, measures to do that. We actually got a grant um, to work with some folks at a, univer at, at a university and at health departments. And I will point to health departments as connections to Latino populations, at least here in Oregon, and I think in other places to other populations, um, ethnic or, or um, populations or particular factors, because health departments work with uh, especially at risk populations, and, and some of those factors exist within a particular ethnic population or uh, other minority. And so I think health departments, and in Oregon, health departments have been doing a lot of work on community food. So it's been a really good connection for us to find out who the gatekeepers and the leaders are. But I really think you have to do so. You can't just ask somebody to represent the group because they look like them or because their name is right. 
um, you have to sincerely do some community building and build the right connections. Anything to add, uh, Wendy, Kristen, or Sarah? I would just say that in our area, we don't have as much ethnic diversity as some others, but that does not mean we don't have diversity, and we just try to revisit who are the beneficiaries of our work, um, how, <clears throat> what parts of the community are, do we think our work is going to address, and then we just try to make sure we have as much diverse representation or find a way to um, do outreach, <clears throat> excuse me, do outreach to folks in those communities even if they can't participate in the council and come to me. And this is Wendy, and I, um, I think it's like the million dollar question and a great question, and I think it's, anyway, thank you for asking it, and one that we all need to be constantly acting, asking ourselves, um, and I hope it comes up a lot here in Colorado when we meet next week and talk about coalition building. Um, and how we're all doing this or not. And I think one just resource to flag is that there's a National Food Policy Council listserv that's posted out of Johns Hopkins University, and they sort of pose questions to the listserv. And in January, at some point, that was one of the questions that they posed, um, was really looking deeply at the structure of these councils. And everyone is a part of this movement, and are we actually doing a very good job of really representing everyone <laughs> in this movement? And I think a really key question there is, um, is this movement just sort of replicating existing sort of power dynamics and decision-making patterns, or are we actually changing it up? Um, so there's a, there is a uh, FPC listserv at Johns Hopkins that we can get you, I'm sure, that um, just there's been some interesting chatter on about this issue that I found helpful. Great. Um, thank you all for answering. Uh, so the next two questions are kind of uh, related. Um, one is, uh, what strategies are existing food system organizations using to reach out? So we already talked about that. And then the uh, final question is, uh, has to do with building power and leadership and food independence in historically marginalized communities. So does anyone have any examples of uh, building power or leadership and food independence in historically marginalized communities or strategies for doing this? Um, this is Kristen, and I can say that we, too, lack diversity in our area, although we have a um, burgeoning Latino population. And because we do work in the schools and through the farmers' markets, we're finding that through kids, we're building um, new pathways for our Latino youth to take leadership in food through both the farmer's market and through uh, school activities. And that's working quite successfully for us, um, so tomorrow's leaders. So being, being open, being flexible. Great. Um, and I have a this question. This is Wendy. Oh, sorry. Can I sorry. jump in there, too? Yep. Sorry. Um, just one. What the, Another great question, lots of potential answers. Just one thing that um, lots of communities have done, in Northeast Denver we're working on a project like this right now, but is this issue of food assessments. And so many communities and so many food policy councils initiate their work by doing food assessments. And then so how do you, how do you build those assessments in a very intentional way so you're raising up some of those marginalized voices and they really, you're really using you know, community-based participatory research methods, whatever fancy name you want to call it, but you're actually really doing assessment and research and question asking and conversing with the community. So I think sometimes an assessment as a first step can be a really powerful way to build some of those relationships and raise up some of those voices. Um, you know, for example, in Northeast Denver, one of the many things is we, there, we have resident researchers. It's not me or you know, my colleague at the local nonprofit out there doing surveys and focus groups. It's actually we have many, many people from that actually live in this community and talking to each other. Um, and there's many other ways you can go about doing this. But it seems to be a really good step to really growing that movement and bringing in lots of different voices before you even get to what are your strategies. And this is Sharon. I just want to just come in and yeah, make me say Go ahead, Sarah. 
Susan share? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to the important part of the community food assessment in Wallowa County. And our rare participant put a lot of time into doing that, um, both in terms of the methods that he used. So the sur people could participate in the survey a lot of different ways, from a paper copy to um, the online version. And we actually had a, almost 2% of the total population of the county participate. And you know, the, the, it was some of the findings from that survey were actually quite educational for. Um, you know, we gave presentations on what that what that survey included, as well as other information from the community food assessment, and it really helped us understand, um, you know, some of the very specific um, challenges that members of our community were facing in terms of um, access to food or challenges that they even had taking advantage of some of the resources that were that were available but didn't didn't meet their needs. So I think that survey process, if it's done well, can um, give you some quality information to work with. So this is Sharon. Um, the assessment process that Sarah just discussed is one that we've refined through our grassroots community food assessments and that we've done in over 20 counties in Oregon. And actually there's a guide to doing those assessments which is a little different than any of the academic or economic development guides that I've seen that's posted on our website. So after this uh, webinar, we'll make sure that you get a link to that. And we'll also make sure you get a link to the Food Policy Council uh, listserv that Wendy referred to earlier. Great. And, um, and the Willowa County Food Assessment is posted, our food assessment is posted on the um, Oregon Food Bank website as well as on the NEO EDD website. Right. Great. Um, and I just had uh, one last question. Uh, well, it looks like somebody has just posted the food policy um, listserv. Uh, we'll also send it out uh, on the an email to all those that attended. And the last question um, I have is, is for Wendy uh, and addressing sort of the work statewide, which is a little bit different than uh, some of the other works, but also um, speaks to regional challenges, but have you encountered any challenges bridging the rural-urban divide uh, working statewide, and if so, how have you addressed this? So the answer is yes. Uh, I think, um, well, yes and no. I think that there's just inherent challenges in having a state body that needs to meet in person. So I think, as I said, you know, the, the State Council always meets in Denver, and we just sort of agreed early on, the members even agreed that that's just the way it had to be for that council to meet. Um, we do have three, four, five members that live at least between an hour and a half and four hours that are coming from an hour and a half to four hours from Denver. So just on that functional side, we do, we, we really committed to now to scaling it back to actually only meeting quarterly, and part of it was for that reason, that if they were going to come down to Denver, they really couldn't come more often than that. Um, and of course, we always have things like conference call ability available. Um, and we then so we do have money to support travel. So if you live over like 50 miles, you can get all your mileage reimbursed. So that's one way we support just that being on the council. Then the issue of really just connecting to the state as a state council, um, we have, because of them, even the Denver-based members have such a strong relationship with the rural constituency. We have USDA Rural Development, you know, on our council, Ron, from the Department of Agriculture. Um, all three of our producers live outside of Metro Denver. Um, and, you know, we have a board member from the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. We, we've had in the past farmers, uh, Farm Bureau members. So we have a constituency that really has a really far reach. So um, that representation has been good. And then I think some of the tours and the listening sessions we did were very effective. Um, we intentionally sort of got out of Metro Denver to do that. Um, and then I think what's going to come next is actually going to be really the most telling is bringing together these local policy councils from every corner of the state, and then and not just bringing them together, but also seeing where our local policy councils mirror their gaps, maybe where are they not taking off. Um, Northeast Colorado is a, is a good example in our state where the infrastructure just doesn't really exist yet. So how can we work with some of our partners like CSU Extension or others that already have a presence there to kind of support the growth of some of that infrastructure so that that through local coalitions, there is representation that we can really work with. So I hope that makes sense. 
Um, but I'm happy to talk more. Great yeah. question. No, that's, that's great. So um, we're getting close to the end. Actually, we're a little over time, but I thought we would go until 12 since we had so many presenters. Um, again, I just wanted to thank all of our presenters uh, for taking the time to present with us and also for uh, everyone um, and your patience while we were going through some technical difficulties. I think I always say the next one we'll have it all figured out, but uh, there's always something new that we have to figure out. So the next one we'll have it all figured out. Um, thanks again, everyone. Our next webinar will be uh, is tentatively set for April, uh, the first week of April, the first Wednesday in April, um, and the topic of uh, taking the food hub model, which uh, the model based out of here in Oregon uh, with EcoTrust, and bringing it to the regional level through sub hubs. And so I'll be sure to send out more information about the next webinar uh, to everyone that's on the Feast Leadership Network list. If you're not, please just send me an email, and I'll be sure to put you on the list. Otherwise, just check our website, and we'll always be uh, posting more up-to-date information on there. So thanks again for everyone for participating, and I uh, hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So did anybody tell you how many people I have?